Kester, you've come back for Double Feature. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Double Feature. My name is Eric, and we've got two movies on the show today. I think you said they were uh, groups of gangs that had no business ganging. Was that the yeah, something to that effect? something like that. Uh, I want to talk about pacifism today, as if that's okay. any surprise to you, <laughs> and how violence doesn't need to happen. All but, right. Uh, I promise in as a little of a preachy sense as, All right. well, maybe we'll see about that. Hey, also, we still have a Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. This is great news. That is great news. We put a video on the Kickstarter explaining... The Kickstarter. <laughs> but I'm really fucking excited about this. I was excited the whole time you had a Kickstarter and I did not. Yeah. And then I was bummed afterwards. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, it looks like Kickstarter is a great idea for having more double feature in the future. Yeah. So that's kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. You can see a video of us. Uh, talking all about the Kickstarter at great length. In the meantime, we're going to spoil this film, uh, both of these films. We're going to talk about these films and not the Kickstarter. Right, and the films in question are The Warriors and Red Dawn. I was going to tell people again, it's kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. I don't want them to miss the video. I'm sorry. You know, we promised people there would be a video after the Glitter Mouse video. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you want a video with us <laughs> actually in it. We're going to make one. Got a fucking camera. We made a video. But you're right. The Warriors and Red Dawn are the movies we're going to spoil. So mm -hmm. we'll jump right into that. You can use the chapters, as always, to skip over the uh, sections where we talk about movies you haven't seen. Or you could listen to them anyways. I mean, totally your choice. Before we get into The Warriors... <laughs> wow. I mean, I already made a chapter, so we're into The Warriors. <laughs> That's true. But before we talk about the meat of The Warriors, uh -huh. when they're at the, the big truce meeting, yes. there is a fucking sample there. The Can You Dig It line is used as a sample in a song. And since seeing it for the show, I have listened to, all I knew was it was a hip hop song. Uh -huh. And I have listened to literally hours of music because it was one of those things that was driving me mad. Yeah, I could hear it in my head and I didn't know what song it was. And I just heard, can you dig it? Mocking me over mm -hmm. and over. No one else will have this problem. But if you do, the song is called The Rape. It's by Cubby Bear. Okay. And uh, I was just so excited. I, I literally, I was listening to my iPhone in headphones in a quiet room when it came on, finally. And I shouted very loudly and embarrassingly <laughs> because of how excited I was to have finally found that. I didn't think I was going to find it. Yeah. I thought it was going to bother me for the whole show. You are probably the only person in the history of watching The Warriors who watched the warriors and picked up on can you dig it as the line they had already heard <laughs> yeah yeah I, don't know. I i've been oblivious to the war i i didn't even know what kind of movie this was you know how every once in a while there are lines from cinema that seep into general knowledge at such a in such a way that people will say the line and you go what is that even from and they go i don't know that is a tasty burger well people know what that's from Right. But I want to have 10,000 of your babies is the one that I picked up on. Yeah. What happens is, I've been thinking about this a lot, strangely yeah. you mentioned this. I think people who have a kind of weight in popular culture mm -hmm. can take phrases from things that inspired them and bring them to a mass audience that has nothing to do with the original thing. Sure. Look at this example I just gave. I know you don't listen to Cubby Bear. Right. But you know that it is a hip hop artist. Right. Who likes the warriors sure kind of a strange thing mm -hmm. the warriors itself being the kind of score that uh maybe calls back more to something like drive you know yeah. the things that drive is calling back towards yeah that 80s era of synthesizers none of this seems like hip-hop culture right but it's kind of a hip-hop line yeah and something like can you dig it i mean that's not a, a great example sure but People just start saying it and it'll get picked up. Well, and the line from the Warriors that has permeated polite society is that this this line, you can't you can't see what I'm doing out there in Podmanity, but I'm doing the thing. Right. A finger claw thing. Clink three bottles together. Right. And I frantically say Warriors come out and play yay. <laughs> right. That line I have heard for the last 20 years of my life. 
Uh, it wasn't until a few years ago that I even knew it was from a film. And to hear it in the context of the movie, you'd think that to hear the line in the context of the film would somehow satiate this need or fall on deaf ears or you would go, eh, you know, yeah, that is that line. That's where that goes. When that guy starts doing it, it is possibly the most <laughs> unsettling. Yeah. I mean, to take these characters who have been through so much from such such a bright start to this film and put them in a situation where that guy is yeah. being that. Uh, okay, so before we even get there, let's go all the way back to the mm -hmm. beginning of this film before we even know to hate that guy, yeah. who is also the leader of the gang in The Crow, by the way. That's oh, T-Bird so from he The is. Crow. So he He's is. also yeah. in um, Penn and Teller Get Killed, if anybody uh, remembers that film. Who's that? David Patrick Kelly? Is that yeah. right? Yeah. David Patrick Kelly was also on the show last week. He's uh, one of the hitmen in Wild at Heart. I love him. Yeah. But we get this this beginning of the film, which which kind of it shows the film's hand in a way that still allows the film to shock you because you get this, Oh, here come all the gangs in New York city. And here's the purple gang. And here's the roller skate gang. And here's <laughs> sure. the updo gang. And here's the gang of Pelicans that live by the wharf and they're all getting on the tube or whatever the hell it's right. called in New York. And right. they're going to get together. And there's this big congregation. There's, there's gang of Palooza. Uh, in the middle of whatever fucking park. Does this the is. Cure and Nine Inch Nails play Gangapalooza as well? I would say so. Yeah, can't believe that's happening. <laughs> Sorry, ignoring that. Go ahead. Um, and uh, we get this beginning of a film that seems like, wow, why are we singling out the Warriors as this gang? We've already highlighted the that story about the war where these people were soldiers and they fought their way through. And here's another story of courage. Right. And then we get this mass of gangs all under the pretext of gangs can unify and take back our turf from the cops. Um, <laughs> sure. I don't know if it's intentional, accidental or just a, a general style to the film, but. Do you realize that this film consists of cops and gangs and yeah, either the gangs own the turf or the cops own the turf, but yep. who else lives in the city? Well, hold on. There's also the DJ that gives you updates via That's true. <laughs> airwaves. That is literally yeah, from Carmen San Diego. I was going to say the DJ from Vanishing Point, but okay, right. Carmen San Diego, that's fine. <laughs> but that is literally the only other character. Right? right. I mean, I don't think we see anybody else that isn't a gang or the cops. The gangs are going to take New York back from the cops. That's uh, despite the fact that it's criminals overpowering the establishment and it's terrifying in actual practice mm -hmm. to put it in the 80s version of gang warfare kind of turns it into this really rad, badass. Sure. Um, pre escape from New York. It, it's you know how on double feature we always talk about post apocalyptica. Sure. I think that the beginning of this film is the first time on Double Feature where we get pre-apocalyptica. We get the spark that would result in post-apocalyptic New York City. Sure. Um, but that spark is doused when David Patrick Kelly guns down the leader of the revolt and suddenly we have a whole new film on our hands. Yeah, this is, so these gangs were all meeting as part of a truce. Right. This is something I want to talk about because it's such a weird thing to me. I was worried when we started watching The Warriors uh, that I would be wrong, which is something I get worried and terribly excited about. Uh, but we had just talked on Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, a film from 1992 uh -huh. that, hey, uh, filmmakers just didn't know gangs yet. Yeah. As a society, we weren't intimately familiar enough with who is in gangs, what makes up gangs, what their life is like to tell a personal story. And then, you know, start watching The Warriors from 1979 and go, oh, a story that's completely made up of gang members. Uh-oh, I wonder if we'll get personal stories about them and I will just, you know, be completely ignorant as usual. Right. But then they all meet for a truce and yeah. they go, oh, wait, comic books and stuff. This is not yeah. this is not a lifetime movie about right. gang members. This truce is such a uh 
impossible thing. Oh, yeah. It's such a buy-in so early in the movie to right. go, well, this is a universe where all of these gangs could have a truce. Kind of tells you about your cartoony nature of things. Sure. Well, and it's it's for some reason it tries to perpetuate this idea that gangs don't have a problem with each other as long as you stay off their land. Yeah, right. As if out in L.A., the Crips and Bloods would stop warring uh, if, if, you know... If, they just didn't cross over the line. Right. I mean, yeah. but in reality, what we have is the Gaza Strip. We have, I want that. No, I want that. So I hate you and I'm going to kill your leader. Well, and let's also think about the economy of gangs. I mean, it's a drug-based economy. Yeah. Well, that's... You know, that, it's a yes. violence-based economy. It's so, about power, intimidation, and having the biggest sprawl so that you can get the biggest reward. Well, yeah, that's why you have the turf. The turf yeah. is... I mean, that's what we don't really talk about in the Warriors. But what is the turf for? The turf is for where you can sell drugs. Sure. I mean, that's basically... Am I totally off base there? No, I think you're dead on. I think you have the turf because that, and it may not be drugs. If you, if you, it could be arms trafficking. Yeah. It could be prostitution. Some kind of illegal be, activity, I you guess. You don't have, yeah, you don't have a gang to be like, this is our turf. This is where we sell realty. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but, not you a, know, you don't want there to be drugs in the Warriors because part of what I think is the magic of the Warriors is that it's a safe territory to you know you're playing risk sure it's not we're using gangs to talk about it but this is for as much as it's about warring factions and death and violence isn't it almost kind of treated in a uh, like a safe fun way i feel sure. like the warriors is fun yeah it's way fun and that's that's where the 80s comes in that's where you can have a purple gang that's yeah. where you well, can have right you're on roller skates yeah it's where it's where one of your gangs is like what if we had kiss but they were the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> right. The Baseball Furies, the most ridiculous <laughs> thing uh, we've seen in a movie on Double Feature in a long time. And calling themselves the Baseball Furies is also the, the most, I mean, it's such a corny name. I mean, but it's a bunch of silent guys with baseball bats, you know, and face paint. It's, yeah. you want to talk about icons. Yeah. I mean, yeah, really corny, really unrealistic, incredible icon, yeah. unforgettable icon, quotable icon. That's, and that's the thing that I think the Warriors does so well with the idea of gang warfare and it's what I love about the Warriors as a gang mm -hmm. is that now you take something like a what they call a motorcycle clubs now biker gangs. Yeah, is that's what they're actually being. <laughs> sure. um, it's, you know, multi-level marketing pyramid scheme, six eggs, one hand, half dozen on the other. But you have this thing now where you have colors and you have, you know, you everybody wears the same thing, but you kind of have a little logo that you get tattooed on your arm or it's on your pants or I don't yeah. know what the hell. I'm not in a biker gang. I was not aware that biker gangs were a multi-level marketing scheme. Oh, yeah. Thanks for uh, bringing some interesting skepticism on the show. I, that was not <laughs> even on my radar. I have research to do after the show. But you get uh, you get this uh, thing where instead of the gangs just kind of subtly because you don't want the cops to know you're a gang right you know fuck that like we're a bunch of dudes that wears red vests <laughs> right and right. the cops are the cops are gonna come up to you and be like you must be in a gang yeah. and it's weird because in 1979 that's just kind of badass it's kind of badass to get all of your friends to dress in the same general badass way. Well, then, from Romeo and Juliet to Greece, I right. mean, we've seen that sure. over and over. The yeah. uh, the vests that make you look like you're ready for a dance off if you watch it sure. today. But yeah, I'm at least told that in the 70s that was badass. I don't know if I really right. believe that. When people saw the Warriors in 1979, did they think badass if they were over the age of 14? I think badass now. But <laughs> of I'm, course you do. Of course yeah. you do. What am I talking about? I wish we could go back to gangs had to dress like the like Bootsy <laughs> Collins and, right. and and George Clinton in order yeah. to be affiliated, yeah. because then at least you'd be like, oh, man, there's a gang. Yeah. Um, One of the things I'm dying to talk about with the Warriors is the chase scene. Yeah. I've been waiting for a really good chase scene in order to talk about one on our show. And I've been waiting for years because I hate chase scenes. Yeah. And that's my own, you know, deal. There's nothing wrong. It's because you haven't seen the French connection, man. There's nothing wrong with chase scenes, you know, but 
Uh, I don't find them nearly as effective as they purport to be for whatever reason. Yep. In the Warriors, that's a lot different for me. And maybe this will be telling because of what happens in it. But it's a chase scene that involves uh, the train, right? Yeah. An elevated train, not unlike our Chicago CTA. Mm -hmm. And uh, having taken the CTA for seven years or something, not doing a lot of driving, I mean, maybe that's just the, the kind of chase I identify more with. I don't know. But they're racing to get to this train. And the reason I'm not a huge fan of chase scenes is I think, one, they go on too long. And two, mm -hmm. there isn't any suspense about the getaway. Right. Maybe I haven't seen a lot of chase scenes where they don't get away at the end. Sure. But the whole thing seems predicated upon, you know, are they, are they going to get away? And of course they're going to get away. So you're kind of watching a set piece. You're just watching a dance. And to me, it's a boring dance. Yeah. But in the Warriors, there, first of all, there's a bunch of people in the Warriors. Sure. And early on, earlier on in the film, you don't really know which ones you care about. Yeah, definitely. So some of them might not make it. You don't even know which ones might not make it. We might have some casualties here. Yeah. And then if you've ever taken the CTA or a, a train of any kind, you don't know when it's going to show up, really. And you don't know when it's going to leave. It's not like when you hop in a car and you start the car right away and speed off. The train runs at its own pace. It's not aware of you. So, you know, they get to the train as if they finally made it, but then everybody hops off that little bus and follows them up. So now this chase is hinging upon the doors being open while they're there and available, them getting on the train, the doors closing before the other you know, gang gets up there, and then taking off. Right. And there's so many things that could fuck up that chase that it becomes more like something I do find there a lot, there's a lot of tension in, which is uh, like a heist, you know, where you have, okay, we're going to perform this heist. These five things need to happen. It's kind of how this chase is. Sure. We need to get to the train on time. There needs to be a train there. The doors need to be open. We all need to get on the doors before they close. They need to close by the time this gang gets there, and then the train needs to pull off before they have time to pull the doors back open. Right. There's just so many things that could go wrong that, you know, they get up there and they get on the train, and I'm still edge of my seat. What if the doors close too slowly? What if one of them gets in? There's a sure. fire. You don't know what's going to happen. If even one of the enemy gang members ends up on the train, suddenly you're locked in there with them. Yeah. I mean, you the stakes are so high because... It's no longer about just getting away. Right. Because your end game is a place where either you're safe or you're in the most dangerous situation. Right. Well, because you're locked in a spot where you can't get away from them. Right. The train is moving. So one of you is going to die either through the direct conflict or through being thrown off the train. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I guess that's your only option. Because the train's moving through space and time. You can't, yeah. you can't just get off. You have to wait till the next stop. So until the next stop, you know, you are locked in there together. It's really tense. Right. And also, I just know how unreliable public transportation is. Yeah. When you have a getaway vehicle, you're trusting that, well, this is the protagonist of the film. Of course, he's a great driver. That's what it's all about, and he's going to get away. But it seems to me like public transportation doesn't work more often than it does. Mm -hmm. So I'm just counting on the train to fail or, you know, the doors close in the nick of time. But, you know, the CTA, the doors might open again three seconds later to let more people sure. on or one yeah. of the things is broken or who yeah. fucking knows. Well, and that's what ends up happening is there's a fire and they end up being not right. as safe as they were hoping. Exactly. They get away and then they make it a couple stops and it's, ah, fuck, now we're. Now we're now stuck we're here and we have to contend turf. with the orphans. <laughs> right, <laughs> fucking orphans. All the gangs have so much character to them. We can easily base a roadmap for the movie off of we're just going to have one after another encounters mm -hmm. in kind of, a, I, kind of a Scott Pilgrim style yeah. of, well, what's the, you know, what's the gimmick of this particular boss battle yeah. going to no, be? Yeah, no, that's what it is. But then there's also scenes um, you know, where the characters encounter some kind of loss because of decisions they make. Yeah. And I feel like that happens just as often as an encounter with the gang. One is, uh, you know, they're spending time with all of the women, and it turns yeah. out the women are themselves a gang. Right. Uh, which is kind of interesting commentary on women in the film. Sure. But what I think is more interesting 
is the guy who becomes chained to the bench. Uh, Dexter's dad, um, James Ramar. Yeah, right. In his, I in his heyday. See, I didn't know that watching the film until you told <laughs> me that. And then I had to go look at pictures and it's pretty amazing. But yeah, you see that actor in a lot of places now. Oh, yeah. But, you know, he goes and he kind of assaults this woman. Maybe just to remind you that this is, after all, a gang that right. you're rooting for. But innocent woman just sitting in the park. And this goes to show our naivete about gangs is we just kind of go, well, what do gangs do? Well, they probably walk through the park to, you know, get some pussy because that's just right. what a gang does. Um, so he basically assaults this woman, pushes her too far, and then she locks him to a bench. And the scene ends with this weird fuck women kind of right. moment. Yeah. What do you think the Warriors thinks about women? You know, where do they fall in the world of this film? Well, that's that's one of the most interesting things about the Warriors is that you get this idea really early on in the film that they're they're brothers and they will, you know, they stand up for each other and they'll go back and, you know, we can't just leave him behind. And, sure. But, you know, they they fucking make mistakes. They're human. They're not good guys. They hang out in the park, you know. Yeah. Get some rape on. Right. Um, even when it's like openly available. Sure. He's not satisfied that it's consensual. Yeah. Uh, because he's a gang member and they rape. Sure. Then we get relationships like Swan and Mercy, where initially he hates her and he totally disrespects her and he thinks she's a whore and that's what women do. Yeah. But later on, you know, she kind of holds her own and and she ends up becoming an honorary warrior. And I definitely think that there is a strong sense of chauvinism within the gang. And I think that it stems from they can't be a brother in in a hardened world of gang warfare. But, you know, you get this sense that when their leader changes his mind. Right. Maybe the rest will follow suit. Sure. Except for the the one Ajax, who is probably the worst one who wants to get his rape on. Sure. Uh, and he's in prison because bad people end up in prison forever and they die there. Yeah. The interesting thing the movie does is it has a lot of uh, great places for women in the story without having great women in the story. Right. You know, we have this group of girls who looks like they're going to save them, but actually betrays them. Sure. But if you want to talk about what is the film saying about women, I think that's a that's an awesome spot because it basically says women are on par with what these men are doing. Mm -hmm. It's one type of feminism. It's to go, women can do everything these men can do. Look, they even have their own gang. Surprise, you underestimated them. You thought they were less than they could be, and they rose above. Yeah. But at the same time, you have uh, you know, this police woman in the park. So it's not just the only women portrayed in the film are scum like some of the men in the film. Mm -hmm. But it's also to say, you know, one of the few characters we really, I guess one of the only characters we see that is truly good and gets the upper hand outside of just the fiction of the film. Right. Just who are we rooting for? Mm -hmm. Who is trying to basically clean up the streets from gang activity, make yeah. uh, society safe for all of these civilians we never see in the movie. And she gets the upper hand on really one of our protagonists. I mean, it's a pretty surprising moment to go, yeah, it's one of our main guys who I guess is kind of a good guy because he's one of the protagonists. I mean, as much as you can draw that line. Mm -hmm. And she gets the upper hand. She outsmarts him and she does what's objectively the right thing. And then also Mercy is an interesting character to look at for how she can win the affections, win the hearts and minds. Uh as we'll talk about in Red Dawn, right. of the gang members from this film. One of the other things that's come up on this show, though, in talking about pacifism is the cause for conflicts and the cause for war. And I can't help but wonder through this whole movie why all of these characters who were once in a perfect, impossibly good truce are now at war. Sure. And when we get the reason that David Patrick Kelly's character uh, does what he does, he basically, it's an anarchist reason. He just yeah. kind of says, well, I felt like it. Yeah. These are the, the, I just do these things. The film opens with these guys are scumbags. This is the scum of the earth all together to take over New York City. Right. And these are all gang members and they're horrible and they don't speak because they're busy playing subway baseball or whatever the hell. Yeah. And then we painstakingly go through this film and go, these are human beings. They have weaknesses. They have strengths. They care for each other. 
you know, they can change. They're concerned with themselves and they want to make, they just want to get home. I mean, they are just human beings at the heart of it. And then we get to the end of the film and we go, ah, here's another gang. What is their human rationale for the horrible things they've done? Oh, I'm in a gang. Yeah. I kill people. Sure. sure. That's what I do. You think that brings it back to reality a little bit? Well, I think, yeah. To go, I oh, think, yeah, senseless violence, you know, kind of like all of being in a gang. Right. I think, I think the film takes you in a direction where it goes, gangs are people too. Yeah. And then it ends by going, the warriors are people too. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> the warriors, gangs are going to fight because that's what gangs do. Right. And the warriors are an example of, you know, a benevolent force in an otherwise cruel world. I think we see that a little bit in Red Dawn as far as the source of conflict. Oh, yeah. And I mean, that's totally not a segue. I do want to talk about, you know, this movie starts with all of these titles giving us some sort of justification for why we're at war. But ultimately, the reason we come back around to is, uh, what is it? The two biggest kids on the block yeah. uh, are just going to fight. That's just sure. what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's talking about the inevitability of conflict. Right. Do you feel like, I know this is really just diving straight into Red Dawn, but do you feel like that's true? I mean, is conflict like this inevitable? Well, okay. So you know what's absolutely fascinating about our look into Red Dawn in 2013 as opposed to 1984 when it came out? The Russians. <laughs> Cold yeah. War. Cold War ended. Yeah. The Cold War ended without heating up. Sure. And Red Dawn is predicated on the idea that inevitably the Cold War will result in one of us destroying the other. That is uh, funny. Yeah. That Red Dawn is basically making a bet, right? Yeah. Red Dawn is going, eventually the Cold War will turn hot. And we're sitting here in 2013 going, actually, um, it won't. <laughs> Wrong. And... Russia never invaded. Nope. And we never invaded Russia, and we both just kind of went, I'm bored. Well, so the message it should be delivering then with um, respect to how history actually played out is that as long as there are big kids on the block, they will have conflict, but that conflict does not necessitate violence. Right. Yeah, I always feel like the Cold War is um, it's something we love looking at at this show, and no matter how often we take time to study it, I just feel like there's more there that we can learn from this extremely long conflict that we called a war. Sure. And yet it was not nearly as bloody as virtually anything else we would consider war throughout history. Right. Well, I feel like the Cold War is one of the uh, crowning moments in the look at human political evolution, mm -hmm. because twice before in the same century over the same amount of stuff as the Cold War, the entire planet started shooting at each other. Yeah. And then World War II ended, and we dropped a bomb, we dropped two bombs, and everybody went, holy shit, maybe not anymore. Well, that was the idea of most of Europe, I think, sitting this one out. Right. Wasn't that the yeah. two wars well, is enough war for the century? Yeah. And so we get this Cold War, and, you know, prior to... Harry Truman dropping the bomb, the Cold War would have just turned into another trench warfare and, you know, U.S. might have won, U.S. might have lost, we may have, L.A. may have burned to the ground, you know, all this stuff, Alaska under the red control, any of this could have happened, but we had realized the breadth of our power mm -hmm. 10 years prior to that. Yeah. And we both, quote, had our finger on the button. But neither mass of the two strongest countries in the planet's history had enough hatred for humankind to push the button. Sure. Never. Well, there's also I that mean, idea of mutually assured destruction. But that's still the same thing, right? Is if you look at the kind of accusations that rest on political heads, we get whatever, you know, mm. Barack Obama Dick Cheney, George W. Bush, they don't care how many Americans die because they've got a bunker in fucking right. the Philippines and they'll be sure. fine. And that's all that matters to them is that them and their family is. Oh, no, that's not true, because if that were true, we would have nuked Russia and the U.S. would have gotten bombed and the president would have been in a helicopter somewhere. And right. hooray for I guess we win the war. Sure. No, it's because for the protection of your nation and for the loyalty of your beliefs. 
you don't wipe out masses of human beings. Right. Even if you're five kids behind enemy lines, you have to keep in mind that war is ugly when it starts. Mm. Once war has begun, the reason war is horrible is because its solution, there are two solutions and it's lose or kill everyone. Right. And so in order to win, you have to slaughter entire nations. Or at least pummel them into the ground. That's the right. war of attrition idea, right? Right. Just make it make it so it's no longer a functioning nation and right. kind of has to sure. give up. It's like bleeding someone dry in Monopoly, basically. Yeah. That's that's my comparison. Otherwise you surrender. And then that counts as losing. Sure. Meanwhile, you and I are sitting over here on the sidelines going, ah, why don't we just surrender? Because yeah, right. nobody will shoot each other anymore. If everyone would that just seems surrender like all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when wars start, why don't you just go, hey, let's not fight. Well, all right. So maybe we don't know anything about war. But uh, <laughs> let me bring us back to something we might know about. But it's still a war question. I promised you last week this was still going to be fucking heady. And I'm, yeah. I'm just... Uh, Got you by the throat for Red Dawn. I apologize. <laughs> we should probably talk about Patrick Swayze or something, right? Uh, no, I want to talk about, we're doing World War Three here. Yeah. Movie Invokes It brings it up. The kind of story that we're going to tell about the evolution of characters from simple kids playing at school to guerrilla warfare, mm -hmm. why set it at World War Three rather than, say, World War Two? Why start? We start this movie and we basically go, we give you titles yeah. explaining the war faster than anyone can humanly read, as if to brush it under the rug. Like Studio said in the sure. last three days before it had to go to real, right. that, oh, someone might go, why did the war happen? Just put these titles in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go, well, that's not really the important part. And you would agree with that, right? Not the sure. important part of the movie, why we're at war. Right, but I do definitely like that the film kind of runs this interesting idea of this is a film about actual events, and these are the heroes of World War Three. Okay, not, well, so that's what I wanted to ask you about, is right. why do World War Three instead of two? It, it's Hollywood, because to do a film about World War II in 1984, here's what would have to change. In order for the enemy to be the enemy of the American people, the uh, Axis powers, so Germany, Japan, those countries, we would have to set it in Poland or Hawaii. Sure. Because, and, and Hawaii would be a stretch. Right. Because we have to set it in a place where the good guys end up behind enemy lines. Right. So you think good guys behind enemy lines is really the reason to make up a war rather than use an existing one? Well, because we want to make teenagers, we want to make teenagers the army and a bunch of Polish teenagers fighting Germans. Right. The thing about that is they lose. Yeah. You know, it's well, this, it, this specific little group, you mean? Well, no, I mean, in general, Poland lost. Sorry, you mean in actual history? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, I, I think that a lot of it is to, to put the American teenager as the, as the fighting force of freedom. Right. And in 1984, again, we're going to go back to our, we're going to go back to our target audience of 19 year old teenage boys. Okay. And granted, this is an R rated film. This isn't, you know, this isn't your PG 13, take your date to the movies, but it's yeah. still, you know, think about it in this way. When you're 18, that's the first time you get to go see an R rated film. Sure. Sure. So you go see a movie where you're kicking Russia's ass in right. 1984, where you and Patrick Swayze and Emilio Estevez's brother are all, <laughs> kicking, you know, the, the son of the guy from Apocalypse Now is right next to you. Yeah. Slaying the Russians just outside your fucking high school. Yeah, I guess you can't talk about guerrilla warfare and also be an American and also put it in World War II. Yeah. If there's three crucial pieces to what makes Red Dawn great, mm -hmm. you can't do all three of them in a pre-existing war, I suppose. Sure. Because I feel like that guerrilla warfare is a huge part of it, too. Oh, yeah. Well, it's because the idea it's... that you are the recipient of the war, that it's happening yeah. for the first time ever on America's soil. Exactly. And guerrilla warfare is also based on the fact that you're a smaller group against a much more organized army. Right. But... Their organization is their downfall. Yeah, this isn't a huge paramilitary group like the Eagle Scouts. This is a, <laughs> sorry, fucking love that. 
there are really funny moments in this film. I think the Eagle Scouts thing is my favorite. But oh, yeah. I also like when the soldiers are in front of the National uh, Park sign. Yeah. They're reading that sign. Yeah. And, you know, the one guy's giving this great story of battle. But the sign behind him says something like, fucking no camping after dusk or something. Sure. He's reading it like, this was this great battle, and here's what the Americans did on this day. They all applaud his uh, great English translation. Mm -hmm. So the meat of the story, then, is about, um, all right, so these other countries invade. It's U.S. soil. I also admire how little time the movie wastes getting into that. Sure. It starts out like it's going to be slow. It starts out like where we have the setup for a small town. Yeah. Dusty, driving pickup trucks. Kind of reminds me of Tremors a little bit. Yeah. We're just going to hang out in that environment. And before you know it, men are raining from the fucking sky and shooting your teachers. That's the best aspect about the film. And that's kind of, you know, the exploitation of the Cold War is the Cold War isn't going to happen on a Saturday when everybody's at home and they all happen to have their guns polished and loaded. Right. The Cold War is going to happen on, you know, a Wednesday morning when you're too tired to be at school and your parents, you know, they're going to work late. So you got to stay late at school and your best friend's home sick. It's and, duck and cover, right? I mean, right. that was kind of the idea. Surprise, here come the Russians. The Russians, yeah. they're not going to call ahead and go, yo, so invasion, I don't know, Friday night, you free? Yeah, there's no real declaration. It's just going to happen. And everybody's, everybody's worried about it. That was one of the scariest uh, parts of the Cold War is that constant fear. Well, and To put and, it in, in an event that happened in our lives, it was kind of the terror alert system. Sure. That looming thing that just something, something red will happen at some point. Look out. Right. And that's what's that's what's so interesting about the uh, the remake that we recently had to put out in what was that last year? Right. With Thor. Yeah. Is that that was instead of the Russians, it was the Koreans. Sure. And that was the Koreans could invade at any moment. And yeah. it's, you know, the same basic idea. Well, surprise again, cinema. Korea has already announced that they're going to bomb us. And <laughs> yeah, movies already wrong. A, it won't be a surprise because they'll probably call ahead and be like, yo, America totally going to shoot you in like 2017 yeah <laughs> so we're going to be the, ready watch yeah. the fuck out well also a surprise to that movie is i think it was supposed to be china right and then something with the chinese box office they like wouldn't carry the movie or something <laughs> so they went well chinese people look like korean people so this will mm -hmm. be okay just change it to korean yeah we had to be racist uh in regards to chinese people in order to get china to accept our movie at the box office yeah among this guerrilla uh, warfare unit, the Wolverines that yeah. I love from their uh, what high school mascot or whatever. High school mascot. Yeah. It's Patrick Swayze, and uh, you've alluded to Charlie Sheen uh, yeah. being in the, <laughs> although I'm more of a Martin Sheen kind of guy. Sure. I don't know who the fuck is in this movie because there's not one close up in the film. <laughs> yeah, none. I don't mean to criticize the film at all. I think it's great that there's no close ups. But when you think about filmmaking mm -hmm. that's a really interesting idea it just kind of as an experiment to go what does a film feel like when you go why have close-ups the definitive way to figure it out is take all the close-ups out and see what mm -hmm. happens yeah and you go oh well i guess that's what close-ups did mm -hmm. and not highlighting any of the stars of the film you don't feel like you get a personal intimate moment to sit down and really stare at their face and see how mm -hmm. chiseled it is and all the hard warfare they've gone through and how dirty it could dance yeah, yeah. you stand far away from the characters you don't get any close-ups and i you know i have some ideas about what that accomplishes but i don't really know mm -hmm. you know you you don't know unless maybe you watch the new red dawn i don't know if it has close-ups or not but it impersonalizes the conflict a little bit which is strange given that we want to tell a story that is personal. It's about sure. how this impacts these kids. But I think that another big feeling of the film is for America. Sure. You know, yeah. less about these kids and more about they did it for their country. So we tell a personal story without seeing really the faces of the sure. people. The face is all of us, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Well, you bring up a good point. This is highly regarded as a very American film, a very mm -hmm. pro-America, patriotic. Right. Uh, if you were to count down most patriotic films, Red Dawn shows up in that list all the time. I just thought it was interesting to sort of see the effect that has uh, on a movie. Mm -hmm. In my head, that's part of how we're able to do these timestamps and go through as much time as we are without really seeing 
we don't have to question wow these characters didn't get all these scars and didn't get sure. really fucking right. dirty and their pores is, didn't get bigger and how is jack even shaving yeah right <laughs> well, wouldn't hurley get skinnier i think about laura croft pre-island and post-island uh-huh <laughs> but we just believe that the characters have become weathered. We don't need to see the proof on their faces. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very hard, very violent time on these characters, and it's taking place over a pretty good length of time. Yeah. We're checking back in every month. Right. Which uh, is a really clever idea, and huh. I wish someone would make more films like that. <laughs> you and I, it was weird. I'm, I'm watching this thinking, oh, and we just get a segment of this month? And mm -hmm. then we get a segment of the next month, and the month after, we get these monthly timestamps. While still checking in. We had an idea for a... We wanted to make a werewolf movie that was good. That yeah, was that our, didn't suck. Right, our stipulation. That was, yep. And so we decided to go about it by coming up with a bunch of movies, ideas that don't necessarily involve werewolves. Mm -hmm. But I remember, not to get on a huge tangent about it, I remember the mechanic we wanted to use... You and I were going to film the film over a great length of time, right. and we were going to complete this nearly you know, unfeasible task by just filming a couple minutes every month. Right. And we thought, good idea for the story. We'll see like right. the same date, February, March. So it'll be these constant checkups in their lives to sort of rediscover, or I guess discover for the first time, what they've been doing over the last 30 days. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to take this kind of reoccurring look at the time that's passed, it makes it feel like an epic. Mm -hmm. No matter how long the movie is, if we go through 14, 15, 16 months or whatever, and we just keep giving the stamp, we feel like time is really making these huge jumps. Right. And that's one of the things that I kind of feel like we don't need to see the characters become sure. weathered. We just believe it. We right. know how we feel like we're going through the same long toll that they are. Right. And that's one of the things that I think is so great about Red Dawn is that you're sitting there and you're watching characters blow up helicopters and that feels like a huge victory. And you don't know which one that is. You don't know which guy that is. Yeah. You know, it's not Jeb pretty much. And eventually a character will die and you feel a terrible loss. But right. it's not a loss for the character. It's a loss for the country. It's sure. a loss. It's a loss for righteousness. Right. You go, that's one man down in the fight against fascism. <laughs> right, right. The attachment comes to the character's drive. It right. comes down to what they're fighting for. Mm -hmm. And again, to bring it back to the, the both to kind of tie in the patriotism with the just checking in over such a long period of time. By the end of the film, you, you think, man, they've been fighting for so long. How can Jeb lose his brother at this moment? Sure, sure. It weighs so hard on you, even though you've only hung out with him for a few minutes a month. Effective storytelling. Um, we have a website, kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, that is the website you go to to make this show happen. Yes, I think so. Ending very soon. And there is a, uh, there's a video on there of us talking about the Kickstarter, so go watch that. What are we doing next time on the show? Uh, next time on the show, we're gonna we're gonna get a little stab stab splat splat. We're gonna do uh, we're gonna do some maniac. We're gonna do some intruder. We're gonna go back to our roots. Yes, I love it. Let's watch more fucking film. Bye.